<laughs> well, you probably don't have it, nor you gave it in the offering, right? <laughs> Amen. It's an honor to be up here. Amen. Thank you, my pastor, for giving me the privilege to be up here uh, to preach. Amen. It is an honor. Uh, it's good to see faces. It's good to see people, uh, especially through this time of COVID. And so God has been helping us. God has been protecting us. Amen. Uh, there was a, uh, so far, these harvesters have been great. Amen. They've been uh, speaking to my life. They've been showing me a few things. And small recap as what we've seen so far, Pastor Ruby, amen. Uh, the after effects, uh, being a good example. Uh, Pastor Alex, uh, the runner. Uh, <clears throat> Pastor Tim, mercy. Pastor Cox, our conduct. And of course, Pastor Ruben, you just heard the sermon now, amen. I was uh, looking at a story uh, about uh, J. Wilbur Chapman. He says that he was in London and he had the opportunity to meet a General Booth. If you don't know who General Booth, he is the founder of the Salvation Army. It says, who at the time was past 80 years of age. Dr. Chapman listened reverently as the old general spoke of the trials and the conflict of the victories. When the American evangelist asked the general if he would discuss his secrets for success, he hesitated for a second. Dr. Chapman said, I saw the tears come from his eyes and steal down his cheeks. And then he said, I will tell you the secret. God has all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I, men with greater opportunities. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London, I made up my mind that God would have all of William's booth there was. And if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has had the devotion of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. So here I pay attention to this story, and I'm looking at this man, the founder of the Salvation Army. And yes, I know, if you look at the Salvation Army uh, they're not the same as they were back in the days. If I look at the history and I look at what this man did, he took a stand in a moment. He looked at the hearts. He looked at the drug addicts. He looked at the prostitutes and he said, I need to be out there and not behind this pulpit right now. So this man makes a decision to go out, and the church did not agree with him at this moment. But because of what he did, he was able, in a four-year period, was able to reach 250,000 people. Think about this man. He's giving the secret. I appreciate what Reuben says. He looks at the form, and many times this is smart, this is wise. Because he's trying to build a character or trying to build something to see what, what they do. If you wanted to look at millionaires, <laughs> far from it, amen. Maybe in heaven, right? But here we find that this man is ready at age. He's older. And they're asking him a question. What is the secret? And <laughs> many times. We lack that question. Many times we lack to ask the older pastors, what is the secret to your success? What was it that you did? What was the issues that you had to go through? Because there is wisdom behind the older pastors. It's wrong of us, especially as younger pastors, to think that we cannot learn from our older pastors. But I go back to this story, and I, I, I just started to focus on what he says here. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart, 
and the vision of what Christ could do with the poor of London, I made up my mind. God will have all William Booth there was. I truly believe with our harvesters, you can see having a heart for the harvest. And as a believer and as time, we come to a point in our lives that God reveals his heart to us. We can see it in the Bible, but there's also times when we are in prayer, when we are at the altar and God reveals his heart to us. Just this recent altar call after Ruby had uh, the, the morning seminars. As I was praying, I felt God. I couldn't even pray. I just felt God speaking to me. But as he was speaking to me, <clears throat> he was telling me, listen to the cries of the people. And I truly believe as pastors and as people, there comes a moment in our lives that God will allow us to hear the cries of the people. Exodus chapter 3, 7 through 10 is my opening scripture. If we look here, here's a moment that God is speaking to Moses. And he says in Exodus 3, 7 through 10, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reasons of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egypt and to bring them up out of the land unto the good land, a large unto the land, flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hezetites and all the other Hittites, right? And therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel hath come unto me. I have also seen the oppression where, wherewith the Egyptian oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that mayest bring forth thy people and thy children of Israel out of Egypt. As I was thinking about this, as you know, I am a new father. Amen again. Amen. Four months, Jacob. But as I was thinking about this, when my son cries, there gets to a point where you, 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 you have to attend. You, you, ha it, it, you can't ignore the cry, right? As much as you want to, and don't judge me, amen? <laughs> and I know you guys are all perfect parents, okay? But there's a time where you can hear the cry of the child, and you got to say, oh, okay, what, what's going on? I, I'm busy. I, I got things going on. But you have to attend the child. Here I see there's a moment, there's a point in what's happening in Egypt. And we see that God is thinking about the cries of the people in Egypt. He is listening and he is hearing the people, the pain and the suffering and what is going on in their lives. But it comes to this and a question started to rise. And it's a question for the church and for the people. Can you hear the cries of the people? Pastors, can you hear the cry of the people in your own city? Because I truly believe in this moment, as God was preparing Moses, God allowed Moses to go through a time to hear the people, hear the cries, to start to prepare his heart. We can see in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, one day after Moses had grown up, <clears throat> he went out there where his own people were and, wa and watched them and their hard labor. He saw the Egyptian beating Hebrew, one of his own people. Then if you look at verse 16, it says, Now a priest in Medium had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the throats to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along, drove them away, 
But Moses got up, came to their rescue, and watered their flock. So here I look at two examples, two situations that God is allowing Moses to see the cry, to see the trouble, to see the the situation that is going on with his people and even people outside of Egypt. This is why I truly believe here that God was allowing Moses and God was starting to prepare Moses to be able to hear the cry even more as he was going uh, with God to uh, uh, set the people free. Church, there is a cry. There are people that are lost. But the church has closed their ears to the cry. They have closed their ears where they don't no longer want to worry about their troubles, but rather they want to worry about their own needs upon their own lives. You know, as I come up here, it's difficult for me to come up here. I'll tell you that right now. See, I... When I, at Watsonville, it's easier because, you know, I got like 15 people. (laughs) And you get up there and you're bold, right? Oh, in the name. And you're just, you know. But you come up here and you're like, ooh, all right. (laughs) But you know what? As I look at Moses, he's being prepared for a huge task. He's being prepared, but his heart is being prepared. His heart is being prepared to be able to hear the cries, to be able to have the heart of God. Because when we look at Scripture here, nothing has changed. God's heart has not changed. God is still the same. He still has a heart to save the man. He still loves man, and he still hears the cries of man. But what has changed is the church. The church has changed, and no longer do they want to hear the cries. There was a moment in time, me and my wife, uh, it, it, it's, it's good to talk to your wife of it, okay? <laughs> But there was a moment, an event that I did. And as I was preaching, as I was speaking about the word of God, I sensed these hearts were so closed. It didn't even matter what was going on in that situation. It was a funeral. But as I was preaching the word of God, I sensed in the hearts, even my wife sensed the same thing. Man, these people are so cold. The hearts are so closed. This is what we are dealing with today, church. People are so closed to the gospel. People are so closed. But there are still cries. There are still people. There are still cities that need a pastor. There are still churches that need pillars. There are still churches that need disciples. But the same way, the way these people's hearts have closed, the same way how the church has closed their hearts towards them. No longer do they care about their needs. I appreciate the sermon that Tim Pena preached. This is what it's about, church. Is as Richard Cox said, it's no longer about us. Stop thinking it's about you. It's not about your family. And I'm even willing to say it's not about your children. It's about the people out there. Can you hear the cry? Are you able to hear the cry? 
First Timothy chapter two, one through five. First of all, when I urge the supplication, prayer, and intercession, and thanksgiving be a made for all people, for kings and all who are high in positions, what they may lead and peaceful in quiet life, God, godly and identified in every way. This is the good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who deserves all, who desires all people to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of God, uh, to the knowledge of truth, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and them, uh, God and man, man Christ, Jesus. There's an evangelist, Gipsy Smith, was asked, "What is the secret to revival?" He said, "Go home, take a piece of chalk, draw a circle around yourself." Then pray, O oh Lord, revive everything inside this circle. We, <laughs> we are the issue, church. We are the problem. It's our pride and our ego gets in the way. It does. As, as pastors, as disciples, OGs that have been here for some time, new people, the new generation, I know it all. It's us. You know, as I was, you know, developing this sermon, amen. Last night, I just finally finished it. Just because Pastor Alex got in some of my sermon. <laughs> I told him, did you notice me man-dogging you? <laughs> I said, because you were stealing a lot of my sermon. Bro. No, I just... But I was just, hey, I appreciate Alex, amen. But as I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about all the sermons that were preached, this sermon is more of a call. It's to call the men and the women. See, many times we think or we believe, right, that the calling is just for the men. But the calling is also for the women. When I, Watsonville first started, it started with a woman. That was, that was our first disciple, was, was a woman that stayed. And recently, we've been getting more visitors, and they've all been women. I've known of stories here in India, the same thing. Women that have come in. We're praying for their husbands. Husbands are now saved, and now they're pastors. Do you not see that even the women are important in the ministry? Do you not see that, men, we can't do anything without our wives? I can't be a pastor without my wife. But it's a calling for all of us, church. We are all the church. And if we are to win people for Christ, the church has to get up. The church has to stop thinking about themselves. I was reading on Ezekiel and Isaiah, and as I was reading our scripture in Matthew, and, you know, labors are few. And in the time, you know, back in Ezekiel, in the time where, you know, the, the, in the story of Ezekiel, the whole Ezekiel and Isaiah, as you read the story, at the moment, uh, what was happening was that uh, there was judgment coming upon uh, Israel, upon the people. And it was a lot to do for their sins. It was a lot to do with their disobedience, right? As I was reading the full thing, here comes two scriptures that I, as I read it, 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 it stuck with me. And I, this is the reason why I had titled my sermon, He Could Not Be Found. Ezekiel 22.30 says, And I sought for a man among them, and should make up the hedge, and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. He is, Isaiah 59.16 says, He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. As I was reading these scriptures, this is where God directed me. And, and 
no man was found. And that was what was scary, because if you look at the commentaries, if you start to look at it and you study upon it, God was waiting patiently for the people to repent. God was waiting and willing to partner up with somebody, but he couldn't find anyone that was willing to do it. He was looking for a man that would intercede the same way that Abraham interceded for Lot. But he couldn't find one that was going to do it. We live in today, this generation that no longer, or can we say the same thing? Is the church or is the pastors are able to say the same thing? And there was no man found. There was this city that's falling apart, but there's no man found for this city. There are people dying, people uh, that are dying in their sins, and there is no man found for that city. It's scary, church, in the time that we're living in today. I truly believe that Christ is coming back soon. And maybe some of us get excited for that now. But some of us still have family members that are not saved. And that, that's not exciting. I remember my pastor Carlos, uh, he preached, uh, I believe it was in Watsonville, and it stuck with me. Uh, and I hope I got the whole story correct. But as he said, he says, you know, I would say that Jesus is coming back and I would get excited. Hurry up, God, come back, come back, hurry up and come back. And so he heard God tell me, what about your family? And that stuck with me. Because, yeah, we, we go through trials. Yeah, we go through, through situations. And, yeah, they can be pretty rough. And sometimes we can say, God, hurry up and just come and take me out. I don't want to pay bills no more. <laughs> oh, is that just me? <laughs> Maybe you say, I don't want to go to work. Think about that. But what about your family members? I once heard a pastor once say, don't tell me you want to see your family saved when you're in the front of the TV. And it goes for us as a church. It convicts us. It convicts me. I don't got a TV, but it convicts me. Because practically this is just a mini TV now these days, right? You should see my phone. It's a, an extra mini one. How is it that the church, I want to see my family saved. But you're not even in outreach. But let's, let's just take outreach out of the way. Do you pray for them? Do you intercede for them? Do you contend in prayer for your family? No one else is going to pray for your family like you. But we can't even make the time to do that. See, God was preparing Moses here. God was starting to show Moses, look, there is a cry. Moses, think about Moses' life. Moses was in Egypt. Egypt at the time was very, one of the richest place. Moses was educated. Moses had a life for himself. Moses didn't have to do what he needed to, to go out and do what he did. He didn't have to. He gave up his pleasures in life. He sacrificed at the end. God was starting to prepare this man's heart. And we look here, having a heart for the harvest. Do you have a heart for the lost souls? Can you hear the cries of the people? Can you see someone and say, man, these people talk so much about me, but they're hurting. Or this person doesn't like me, but that's okay. I'm still going to pray for them because they still need to be saved. Or do we get our rebellious attitude? No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to pray for them. You know what they did to me? You know what they said to me? 
Who cares? What does Jesus think about you? He loves you. He cares for you. He died on the cross for you. When I'm in outreach and I, I speak to the homeless, you know, and I, I'm just talking to them, you know, one of the, the things I like to tell them is that, you know, man, it doesn't matter how the community looks at you. What matters is the way Jesus looks at you. And it's true. We can become pretty judgmental as people. We can look at something and we can hold a grudge. And it's not even all about that. The church has lost its focus. Jesus saved us so that we can go out, proclaim the gospel. We can see more to be saved so that when we all die, we can go to heaven. But it seems as the people or the church is preparing their heaven on earth. We're not Jehovah Witnesses, church. We're not staying. Why is it that we prepare our and we prepare a future here? Yes, I get it. There's a life balance. But now that we know the times are coming, it's coming soon. And we still are focusing on ourselves and not on the people out in the streets. Why? There was no man found. One of the commentaries says that if there was a man found, was there a possibility that the blow or that judgment would have been a little less? Was it a possibility? Christ is looking. And he wants to do the impossible for us. There is a evangelist that once said, God is looking for people through who he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. This is true, even for us as pastors. Well, I'm just going to do what I can do. Mistake. We should be doing what God calls us to do. And even looking beyond that. But we only focus in our, 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 our abilities, right? We only look at what we can do. And most of us, I can probably guarantee that maybe 95 to 99% people here probably don't have a lot of confidence in themselves. Because I don't. Especially coming up here to preach. Whew. As Reuben says, I was that one that needed to run to the restroom, go throw up and come right back. <laughs> I'm the one that in my faint, come and pick me up quick. I'll, I'll get over and come back. I'll come back. You know, yeah, the same way that this man says, you know what? There was men greater, men with smarter, men with better opportunities. But you know what? They might have that. But they don't have the heart for the people, the way these pastors do, the way these people do. And this is what we're trying to put in and give you guys the vision to understand. It's not about you no more, church. It's about the people. We need runners. We need men. Northern California needs churches. But will it be as the scripture said, and there was no man found? There was nobody found. I'm just going to say this to say this. I can tell you one thing. There's men here that you know you're cold. You, 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 you know it. And I'm not saying that you're, you, you, you feel like you're cold. No, no, you know that you're cold. But are you ignoring the voice of God? Are you ignoring the call? Because think about that call. That call, if you answer it, can make great impact. Souls can be saved based off of that. But because you don't make that, the question is, will there be souls that were the plan that God had? And yes. 
God's plan will move on and God will find another man. In the same way as Pastor Reuben said, opportunities. But God is calling you. God is asking you to reach the lost. God is asking you to have a heart. And this is why you're in church. He's preparing your heart the way he prepared Moses, that you can listen to the cries, you can see the people, and that you can go and witness and tell people about Christ. God wants to do the impossible. And I look at Matthew chapter 9, 35 in closing to 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. When they said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. I looked there and the labors are few. Why? Why? Why, why is there so few? What is man so busy doing? They can't hear the cries of the people. Can't see the suffering of the people. See, this man Booth, it took him to fully surrender his heart. It took him fully to surrender, to be able to see and to hear the cries of the people. 250,000 just because he made a decision. Is there men here that will stand up and preach the gospel? Is there women that will back up those men to do it? Because I'll, whatever future you're planning, soon it'll be gone when Jesus comes back. I appreciate the men that were willing to get up and go. I appreciate my pastor for coming from China. I appreciate that. Because he heard the cries of India. Do you hear the cries of your city? You should. Do you hear the cries of India? Do you hear the cries? Amen. That's all I have. Amen. Praise the Lord. Just a quick reminder. Please be back uh, in uh, the sanctuary five minutes.